Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the breakout sessions as much as I did. Every presenter provided critical, such critical insight around resilience and well-being. We were fortunate enough to have Julia provide her expertise on how to mitigate or prevent the causes of burnout. We also had Chris, who engaged participants in discussing our ability to, let's see, I have a quote, foster volition, resilience, and student well-being. We had Jamie, who presented ways to empower English language learners, and she graciously shared her experiences with her own students, many of whom live below the poverty line. We also had Catherine and Kristen with the all important ideas on how to teach resilience. If there were ever a time that we needed to learn how to teach resilience to our students and ourselves, this is that time. Now remember, for any of the breakout sessions that you were not able to attend, we will provide a recording of all the sessions within the coming weeks. So look out for that definitely because I will be watching them several times over. Uh, the next part of our program is our education roundtable. And just like with the other parts of our program for today, I'm, I'm super excited about this part as well. We have esteemed panelists who will discuss and explore what our education system would look like if all students, especially our historically resilient students, were supported to thrive in ways that prioritize student well-being and resilience. This roundtable conversation will explore issues at the intersection of the pandemic, social and racial justice, and student well-being and resilience. Our panelists will generate ideas on how teacher leaders and all education leaders can drive impact in policy, practice, and advocacy that benefits all students, every student. Moderating this discussion, I'm going to bring back Bob Williams, Dr. Bob Williams, Enstoy's president and acting CEO. And I hope he mentioned earlier that he's also the 2009 Alaska Teacher of the Year. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to him so he can then introduce our roundtable panelists. Thank, thank you very much, Natasha. This is uh, absolutely fantastic. And as, as Natasha mentioned, uh, this has been an absolutely fantastic day. We had we had the opening keynote by uh, Sydney Jensen. Four incredible uh, breakout sessions going on simultaneously that you're all going to get access to, and then today's education roundtable I think is going to just take this even further. And we have incredible uh, esteemed panelists. We have Nebraska Commissioner of Education uh, Matthew Bloomstead. He's also the president of the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers, CCSSSO, is with us today. Uh, Bobby Kavner, uh, secondary English teacher, department chair, 2017 North Carolina Teacher of the Year, and an NSTOI board member. Uh, Korsha Hassan, a student-centered and community-focused fourth grade teacher, and the 2020 Minnesota Teacher of the Year. Uh, Ariana Prothero, uh, a journalist with Education Week, and she has written extensively and reported extensively on student and teacher well-being and uh, the education effects of the pandemic. And Dr. Richard Warren, he's the 2019 Maryland Teacher of the Year, has extensive experience on st in STEM Medal School, and he's currently a professor at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, recruiting and preparing future teachers. So uh, just a great honor to have these panelists with us today. Welcome. So a, a warm, warm welcome to, to all of you. And it's, it's great to be here. And so the, I guess the opening question, I, you'll have a chance to introduce yourself further, but the, the opening uh, question is uh, for the panel is, the, the, the pandemic has caused interruptions to our education system over the past year and a half that have disrupted student learning in many profound and inequitable ways. Uh, many of the more than 600,000 US pandemic deaths have deeply affected our students, our teachers, and our schools. Uh, NSTOI, National Network of State Teachers of the Year, teachers and teacher leaders across the country are, are deeply committed to equity, social and racial, racial justice, 
and creating learning environments where all students are supported and can thrive. On, on the one hand, we, we don't want to be overwhelmed by this responsibility and be paralyzed. On the other hand, we also don't want to be uh, discount or ignore the trauma that students have experienced and start this fall thinking that everything's just going to start up like it was and be back to normal. Uh, let's, let's make sure we don't underestimate this challenge. Let's be clear about what the challenge is that we're facing. So I'd like each of you to uh, feel free to introduce yourself further and, and just share some of the challenges in terms of student and teacher resilience and well-being that you've seen, you've experienced, could be personally or professionally. Um, but please feel free to share. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Richard Warren. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Enstoy, for uh, the wonderful introduction. Um, I'll just I'll just park on one area, and this area that I have experienced personally, and I know if I experienced it personally, I know that many others have experienced it as well, and that is um, grief. What does grief look like in our personal lives? What does grief look like in the classrooms? And what does grief look like in the overall school community um, during this time? Um, and one thing that you know I'll share is that throughout the pandemic, um, unfortunately, I had to bury my mother. Um, she had COVID, and she's no longer here with us. And just that simple idea of having to bear the weight of losing a loved one, it really impacted the way that I went about um, teaching, learning, and the overall school system. And I'm an adult. And so I know it is going to be extremely hard for a student um, to exhibit learning gains when they're still wrestling with grief. And one of the things that I that we see is that it's hard to make learning right if we treat grief wrong. And so one of the things that I've been able to, to kind of talk to districts about moving forward is how are we addressing grief on whether that be losing a loved one whether that whether that means being losing uh, a meal, whether that means losing, um, you know, a safe place, uh, how are we able to restructure that in a way where we can get kids access to those things so that they can begin to learn. So that's just one of the things that I've been able to see and experience personally. And I know that there are many other students and, and teachers and families who are dealing with the same. Dr. Dr. Warren, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh... Ariana. Yeah, actually, I, if I could just build off a little bit of what he said, I've, I've, uh, what Richard was saying, um, I think grief is a major thing that's going to be facing a lot of students, um, of course, also teachers, educators. Um, but I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of school psychologists about this. And the, um, time and time again, I've heard that grief is going to be a really big hurdle to get students over this coming year. And not just grief of loss of a loved ones, but loss of, um, things that may seem not as consequential to adults, uh, loss of graduation, graduating from even middle school or loss of a sports season. These are all things that students are going to be grieving and feeling grief over. Um, and it's just important to keep in mind that many adults do have experience with grief and we know what to expect, how to work through it. And this is something that students, a lot of kids don't have experience with. Um, and, you know, that can be manageable from an adult's perspective for, you know, one, two, few students, but this is something that nearly all students are going to be dealing with to some extent or another. Um, so I do think that is one of the kind of one of the big things to focus on, um, you know, in terms of what I think we've learned this year is that you never know when a global once in a century event like a pandemic will upend education in our world and that kids and adults need to have um, the social and emotional and resiliency skills to weather an event like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Korsha. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, peace be upon you all. Thank you, Bob, for reaching out um, and uh, emphasizing uh, the importance of my voice and my perspective on this panel. Thank you to Enstoy. Um, and thank you to Dr. Warren uh, for sharing a very personal part of your life um, and setting the tone for um, vulnerability. I like to leave the room or read this space uh, before I share my own lived experiences and my trauma 
um, and my story because I think that you know all of those are gifts. Um, and I think um, I am impressed with how you're able to share about your grief, holding space for you um, and your family. Uh, I look at the word resilience with a critical eye. Um, I'm a black educator. I'm deep in the trenches. I was born and raised in this country, um, and I was taught that uh, if I had enough grit, if I persevered, if I had the growth mindset, I could overcome everything. And essentially, um, what I didn't realize is that that was forcing me to compartmentalize the trauma that I was going through, um, the homelessness, um, the, uh, the witnessing of my mother being physically abused, um, food insecurity, et cetera. And so, um, I push back on especially our black and brown students being required to be resilient uh, when facing not only a pandemic, but um, institutional inequities that lasted more than a year um, that have been pervasive in our, in our country's history and its foundation. Um, and something that I've been wrestling with lately is thinking about, you know, if this pandemic didn't reach um, affluent white students and their families, would there have been um, a deep investment? Would there have been a deep understanding of just how hard it was for students who um, survived this year, for educators who um, go through this year and be forced to perform under abnormal circumstances? Um, and you know, as I reflect on what I've gone through this year, not only as the Minnesota Teacher of the Year, but also as a Black Muslim woman uh, facing um, you know, uh, indirect and direct racism in and out of my school. I think about how I don't want to be resilient. I don't want to have grit. Um, I want to be soft. I want to share my story. I want to be loved. I want to be cared for. And that's the space that I've been providing my students this year, um, a space for them to know that I'm not just focusing on their life class or race hurdles this year, but, but to have a deep investment in their lives and who they are as a person, who they are as an individual, um, and what they can become. Um, and then I'm not going to ignore their lived experiences. I'm not going to tell them to package them up in a pretty box. I'm not going to plow on socio-emotional learning and expect that to fix everything. Um, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be vulnerable myself um, and honor the fact that we're all messy. We're all um, trying to get through this year as best as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. That that concept of some students are forced to be resilient, and and we want all students to be resilient, but um, we need to make it so that a lot more students are not feeling so forced to be resilient. And how we do that? Um, thank you, uh, Bobby. Oh, thank you very much, Bob. Um, I'm Bobby Kavnar. I'm a high school English teacher, and so I teach entirely seniors. Um, and the last year on our senior class has been really surprising to me. What, what I've seen in, in my classroom is a, um, I think our speaker said you have to Maslow before you can bloom. And that, that really struck me because I have students who are taking care of younger siblings. I have students who are working full time in order to pay the bills when their parents were laid off during COVID. Um, I have students who who are um, reassessing what's truly important to them and to their families. And un unfortunately, many of them are saying, hey, the the needs that my family have are are they come first. They come before education does. And so we've seen an enormous rise in absenteeism, in failure rates, in dropout rates. And I'm very concerned that that may continue going forward, that I, I just don't see the buy-in that I used to in my classroom. And it, it makes absolute sense when you're going through something like the pandemic, that suddenly other needs are far more important than education. And so I'm concerned about how we convince the next generation of high school students that high school and education and further education is necessary. Many of them have reassessed their values and it it worries me that we saw such an enormous number of, of absence and absences and dropouts. Thank you. So that that building trust with students and and getting getting that buy-in back is is another part that we really have to look at. And now uh, uh, 
Commissioner Bloomstead. Yeah, and really just uh, an honor to be with all of you and really, uh, um, uh, you know, it is, it, it's a really striking moment to me in so many different ways and everyone's in, uh, I'll, I'll say different places, but the same place. And so it's, it's great to be unified with you and in, in this conversation here today. Um, one of the things, and even whether you go from grief to the notion of what it really students need to be supported, and uh, I find myself in this unique position of, of trying to support uh, teachers and school leaders and school board members even on uh, managing uh, through through the midst of this, as well as even my national colleagues in supporting one another. And so I think one of the the major themes that I see and feel is I actually always feel just a little bit better about the moment in time when I'm able to help and support others. And I know that's the essential underpinnings of, a, of an education system built as the one that we have. And I think everyone spoke to that, that notion of supporting the students and those around them. And um, what I would really say is um, that's an empowering thing, I think, for us to take care of ourselves as well, uh, to ensure that others are being helped so we can can do that. I've, I've described and we're working on a kind of a theme in Nebraska around this notion of an opportunity of a lifetime. And you may see think that that sounds overly uh, um, optimistic in, in these challenging times. But I the real theme is that every day is an opportunity of a lifetime for our students and our classrooms and our families. And some of those opportunities uh, may take the form of crisis. And some of those opportunities may take the form of grief, unfortunately, and some of those opportunities may take uh, hopefully the form of, you know, some semblance of normal in, in a classroom setting and with that love and regard that, that teachers and only teachers really can give in that classroom setting. And so um, I, I want folks to be focused on uh, not just uh, coming out of uh, a pandemic, but realizing that we can be changed for the better in this in this one opportunity, that we can be thoughtful about the set of priorities that our students will have and do have as they manage through, through their daily lives. And this chance um, for us to kind of convene and speak here, I think is uh, just a great opportunity itself. So thank you, Bob, and thanks for the, the chance to be with you today. Absolutely, I think, I think the, this framing it in a positive way is an opportunity of a lifetime, but also with, with uh, Dr. Richard Warren's that if we, if we can't get the learning right, if we get the grief wrong and, and, and making this all work together and, and, and having a, a strategy and a plan. So the next, the next question, um, during this past year and a half during the pandemic, there has been inequitable impacts on learning loss, or as Enstoy prefers to say, unfinished learning. Uh, we have unfinished learning, unfinished teaching, uh, unfinished leading, and, and unfinished healing. Um, most of our schools have transitioned from distance to a type of hybrid to in-person instruction in this past year. Um, what, what did we learn from that experience? Um, how, do we, how do we best address unfinished learning in ways that also build and foster student resilience and well-being and joy? Um, how, do we, how do we build and foster student resilience and well-being and joy and address unfinished learning and do it in a way that, that works well? And um, let's... Let's start with uh, uh, Ariana. Excellent. So I think um, something that this has really shown a light on is the importance of mental health, um, supporting student mental health, supporting their emotional and social needs. Um, and I mean, we have just seen in our own surveys at Education Week, in our internal metrics in terms of what stories are getting read and by whom and by how much, um, as well as just from what we're hearing, talking to educators, there has been a huge increase in interest in these areas and SEL and also student mental health. You know, and there was also, I think it's important to remember, students' mental health was really suffering prior to the pandemic. We were seeing, you know, big rises in uh, suicidal ideation, in anxiety and depression. I mean, it was already kind of crisis point before the pandemic. And then you add the pandemic on top of that. And that's really the situation we're coming out of the pandemic with. Um, and I think you can see from educators a really big emphasis and an acknowledgement that in order to 
recover learning that um, addressing students mental health needs and social emotional needs has to happen alongside of that. Um, kids cannot learn if they're scared. Kids cannot learn if they feel insecure, if they feel unsafe. And these other needs need to, need to be met in order for them to be able to think about, even begin to think about things like math and science. Um, and we're not just seeing a recognition of that importance from educators. Um, of course, you're on the ground, you've been teaching these kids all year, you know this is important. I think what's interesting is that we're seeing you know, real emphasis of, of that from the federal government as well. Um, you know, in all of that COVID relief money, a substantial portion is supposed to go towards meeting students' social, emotional, and mental health needs. So I think it's a it's an interesting time for this. I, I, I just just a real quick follow up. I think I think this emphasis on on uh, student mental health is is important. What? How do you discern, and I don't think there's, there's a lot of people signing up like, yeah, I think we should do that really badly or really well. How, what are the differences between seeing it done well and seeing it uh, done poorly? What does that look like? Yeah, in terms of mental health, supporting students' mental health or yeah. in terms of, yeah. well, yes. I think so one requires an acknowledgement. Yeah, I think one, you know, it requires an acknowledgement from district and school level leadership that this is something that needs to be tackled. Um, and I think, you know, it can be done in a variety of ways. Um, you know, I think important, I think it needs to be done kind of at a holistic level. It needs to be kind of infused throughout the school day in every part of the school. Um, and it has to be, you know, something I hear time and time again from experts is it cannot, these efforts, especially in terms of mental health, cannot just be focused on the students to work. It also has to focus on teachers. Like teachers cannot be expected to help students and support their mental health if they are not getting that kind of support from the administration. So I think one sign of how this is done well is whether teachers and educators are being included in these efforts and that their needs are being attuned to. Thank you, thank you very much. And let's um, let's go to uh, Korsha. So um, my school district went through all three. Uh, so this school year we started off hybrid, uh, then we transitioned to distance uh, around Thanksgiving. Um, did that for about two and a half months. Then on February fourth, twenty twenty one, the date that will always be um, just embedded in my brain, uh, we went back full in person. Uh, and something that um, sticks to my head, at least, is how can there not be unfinished learning? Um, uh, just a year with hybrid teaching or distance or even in person um, uh, amidst a, a pandemic is already incredibly inconsistent and uh, traumatic and harrowing. And so you add all of these other layers to it. Um, and you just know that not only is there unfinished learning, there's also unfinished teaching. Um, and something that I tried my best to create um, in my classroom, not just this year, but something that I um, am really intentional about is creating learning partnerships. Um, students and I make an agreement that we are there to learn from each other, to learn um, content, and to learn about the world and community around us. Uh, but before we do that, we also really need to create space for healing, for sharing, for understanding each other and our lived experiences. Um, in Minnesota, not only were we grappling with um, the racial uprising or the reckoning, whatever you call it, uh, but just within the school year, um, we lost three black men to police brutality, um, Alton, Dante, and Dolal. And the last um, uh, man was Somali American. So it, it even impacted me more as a Somali educator um, who teaches Somali students. And so um, I was very intentional about creating space, not to necessarily only discuss trauma, right? Because as Bob said, joy is really important too, um, just as important, if not more important. Uh, but I was really um, intentional about creating these spaces because I knew that if I didn't, learning would essentially be their brains would be wired to think about those um, events and the tragedies um, and, and any unanswered questions or thoughts. Um, and I wasn't necessarily the only one facilitating. We create this space uh, during morning meetings where 
students all feel uh, powerful enough to share their truth, but also to answer questions and to share their knowledge. Um, and I think because of that space that I create in my classroom that validates students' experiences and uplifts my black and brown um, students' voices, I think it created this really powerful community where we learned about um, not just you know giving up per se um, or that learned helplessness, but really um, encouraging interdependence and coming together, being one, um, and you know kind of working through this really um, oppressive and harrowing year. Um, and then you know as a black educator, I will share uh, vulnerably that you know this year took a toll on my mental health. I mean, there were years that I really struggled. I had 35 fifth graders one year, which never happened. Um, but this year really just took me for a loop. I was, you know, um, dealing with imposter syndrome of not feeling like I was worthy of a title. Um, I was also um, dealing with just, uh, some normal struggles of feeling like an isolated black educator, the only one who is touting anti-racism, the only one who's practicing it um, and living it in and out of her school. Um, within my grade level and within my school site. And so just that that feeling of being alone um, is something that I didn't address until months later. And that really impacted me. Um, I was very critical and open with my students about how Ms. Hosha wasn't always feeling her best, but that she would put her best foot forward. But I think that also humanized me. I'm not perfect. I don't tell my students that I you know, have my life together and I think that allowed them to really be their authentic selves and we were able to learn the school year despite the, the crazy circumstances that we dealt with. Just just real quick, I think I think one of those things you shared, you know, there's the, the pandemic and all the learning and everything that you're trying to do and going through three different things and you're you're also dealing with racism and all mix of it and that just that that just and and it, it sounds and is exhausting what what kind of support do you need i mean it sounds like you're you're looking at ways to make sure your students are feeling welcomed valued respected and experienced joy what kind of supports do do you need as as an educator so that um it isn't it isn't as isolating for you uh, Bob, that's a brilliant question. I wish my school leaders and my school administrators asked me that question. Um, I think it is such an important question for black and brown educators to be asked what they need, but also for the system to realize that they are constantly going against the grain and should be provided with all the supports there, um, affinity spaces, um, spaces for them to feel supported, um, something that I really dealt with this year was being vocally anti-racist um, in my classroom. Um, I read a children's book that garnered a lot of um, racism and hatred um, and uh, a very pro-police um, sentiment. And um, I think the, the essential uh, misunderstanding was that I was indoctrinating my students, right? Because I was teaching the truth. I was, um, you know, connecting with my very diverse classroom um, and also speaking to my own experiences with police, right? Um, and so something that I wish my school leaders would have done was to, to really um, tackle that issue with me. And instead, I really handled it alone at my school site. Um, my community did a wonderful job. My parents, um, uh, the community members stood up and were very vocal about um, how not only it was wrong for me to get this mistreatment and this hatred, um, but they stood beside me and essentially stood in front of me and to kind of shield me from all of the um, threats and the violent comments and messaging that I was getting um, both you know, sent to my school and then also on the interwebs. So um, what black educators need uh, are supportive and fearless um, school leaders, um, administrators, superintendents that uplift Right, that support them um, not only when, excuse me, but shit's hitting the fan, but all year round, right? Um, with anything that we teach, um, and essentially, you know, the fact that we really um, know our students very well, especially our, our black and brown students, uh, because we've been there. We we've, we've gone through the U.S. education system. We've um, internalized that oppression from K through 12, and so we know we know what they experience, and 
we understand that deeply. And because of that, we advocate and we amplify. And when we do that, we need the support of our leaders. Thank you. I, and I think I, I keep coming back to, you know, Minnesota 2020 Teacher of the Year, and and you're still having to wrestle with all of these things. And I think I think for all the teacher leaders and administration and school uh, system leaders out there, I think um, just this importance of of being very supportive of uh, teachers of color and and making and realizing that student and teacher resilience is is something that it isn't can't just be a check the box. It has to be something we live, and it has to be something where we get feedback. Uh, from teachers of color and from our students, and make sure that we're measuring up. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you for that, um, Bobby. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I wrote a piece a while back. I was just thinking about, um, and it referenced John Philip Sousa, who said, who wrote an article called "The Menace of Mechanical Music," and he was concerned that in the future with mechanical music at our fingertips, mothers would just push play on a phonograph instead of singing to their children while, when they went to sleep. And I thought about that a lot this year when we had to move to virtual teaching in my district, we suddenly you know, found an amazing amount of programs and technology and these things that would help reach our kids. There are reading programs and math programs and, um, and they were fantastic tools, but they were intended to be just one of many tools that we use to reach our kids. And then when we came back in the classroom, many teachers were very excited to sort of rebuild the classroom rapport and the community and the fun, like you said early, the, the fun of learning. And um, many of them were saddened to find out that we were told, no, we need to continue in those digital those digital tools because we still have this hybrid model. There are still kids at home and we understood that. Uh, but uh, this summer, for example, we had a summer school program because there were many, many students who failed courses, needed credits. And I was talking to some of the teachers who were going to teach the summer program and they were so excited. They were talking about it like a boot camp and they were going to bring kids in and have readers theater and they were going to do exploratory learning. And uh, as they started finding more and more about summer school, they found out, no, 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 you're just in a room with kids on a computer doing credit recovery. They won't even be necessarily students in your subject area. They'll just complete the credit recovery program, turn the thing into you, and then they'll get their credit. And it, it was so disheartening for these teachers who were excited to teach again. And if you think about, you know, the joy of teaching and the joy of learning, it it's it's my fear that more and more we're seeing digital learning as working as a solution to things like rural education or uh, students who uh, are chronically absent or um, you know a plethora of other problems that we see in education and and it it's my fear that this sort of menace of mechanical teaching is going to take over and we're going to lose that passion, especially in young teachers and see more than ever burnout and a lack of retention in teaching. And I think it's really important that we we embrace digital learning and digital tools, but remember that they're just a tool and that passion and fun and relationships and eye contact and and sharing are are just as important as the as the actual you know numbers on on that math test and that i was talking to a, a state senator once who said well what you're describing sounds like summer camp this isn't summer camp at school and and that's always stuck with me because if i if i could design a school it'd be as much like summer camp as i could possibly make it because i remember every moment of my summer camp experience and and those lessons stay with me a lifetime and so I think coming into the fall, one of the ways to deal with the both the grief and the burnout and the learning loss is joy, is remembering what we love about learning and remember what we love about teaching and getting that back and getting joy in the classroom again. Bobby, I, I, I just, uh, 
I, I, I was one of the, I was actually one of the teachers that brought, uh, I, I was excited about it and brought a, a, a a learning management system to the district that they, I was trying to get permission to use it with my students and then they ended up implementing it throughout the whole district, but it's a way to kind of add on to the learning experience and have discussions with kids and they could share videos and projects and things like that. So it's really exciting. But what you just described, I, I think is, is very scary. This idea of we come back to in-person learning and, and then we, we kind of suck the life out of teaching and, and, and it's almost like bringing the worst of in-person learning uh, back and, and not really highlighting what its really strengths are is this yeah. strikes me that the design of this never it did not engage. One of the mistakes that I think is there is it sounds like they didn't really reach out to teacher leaders and teachers in this process to really design the, the kind of the best of both worlds. How do we highlight the best of in-person learning? And have some digital things attached to it. Um, is that is that accurate? I, I think so. I I think the digital tools are excellent as tools. They they are mm -hmm. they're excellent tools. But like any tool, if it becomes the if it becomes the goal of education to succeed at these digital tools, you you check these boxes, you you hit these numbers. That's that's never been the goal of public education, and it it it's a sort of backwards world now where um people are seeing the digital tool as a, a easy fix to what is actually an incredibly complex problem because we have a shortage of teachers in america and young people are not choosing teaching and so looking down the road how do you teach large numbers of kids um efficiently and if efficiency is what you're after, then digital programs that are simply plug and play programs, you click the video, you answer these questions, that is efficient, but that that creates machines. You are you're putting kids into a, a mechanized mechanical school and it, it, you'll unsurprisingly get robots out of it. I, I, I worked with some teachers this year that had the had distance learning and then they came back to in person and they were so fatigued by the screen time that it that even though they were benefit, it had to be like almost phased in, you know, five minutes this week or 10 minutes or then to 15 minutes because they they they'd had so much screen time and they wanted to get out. So it mm -hmm. it doing doing this well and engaging with teacher leaders and teachers in meaningful ways uh, seems to be a strong uh, component of, of what's needed. Um, next, uh, Commissioner Bloomstead. Yeah, and I, I want to kind of hit on the, um, uh, the fact that across Nebraska, we had a, a lot of in-person uh, through all of the last year, mostly in-person, um, but also quite a bit of hybrid. And then uh, depending on the school districts, they had different strategies relative to how they did that did did that particular hybrid work. And and one thing that I saw that was really a challenge, maybe going to some of Bobby's points, you can't you can't just um, um, turn on a computer and make that work. Our teachers really had to change their practice with engaging students in in both in front of them and in the classroom, perhaps as well as in some cases where they had to do both. And, all, and engage with students that were uh, in a remote setting. And so that was quite a challenge. And I, I, I met with and, and created an, um, through, through our teachers association and with a group of teachers created kind of an advisory group on how I could be helpful to teachers in the classroom as they were uh, dealing with these unique in, environments and challenging environments. And both trying to be really dedicated to supporting their students as well as understanding what a high quality instruction looks like, right? And and uh, it was it was uh, you know pretty intense for for those that were teaching in um, kind of both worlds at that at that moment in time. And and um, uh, I found it you know fascinating because um, in spite of like all of the guidance and you know, our thoughts about what would work best. Um, we had to learn in the moment. And and one of the things, or at least I hope was helpful, was trying to ensure that, and, and I got it from these teachers that were advising me, but they really needed time to rethink strategies 
and we we found some ways to ensure that they could do that and do that effectively. I had so many great conversations about what do you do when they, you know, if that students at home and in a remote setting, they just simply shut off the computer and walk away, right? What's the what's the strategy for that, and what's the strategy for for um, uh, when you have students in front of you, as well as trying to keep those uh, in a remote setting engaged at the same moment in time. And so um, what I found to be most uh, kind of fruitful in the in the efforts is to really uh, ask teachers what they needed, how to support them best, what were the best ways to, to go about that, those particular processes, and, and then give them time um, and give them permission almost to have the time to do do some of those things and, and do those well. Uh, I think our connections with parents um, in, the, in these moments were, were really important as well and, and continue to be, and I think always were, but it took on a different, a different sense of urgency around how to keep folks uh, and keep, keep parents and caregivers in, engaged in some fashion that was, that was helpful. Um, it also, um, you know, really brought brought home the importance of, of um, you know, those relationships that teachers do have with their students, and you know, in in across Omaha Public Schools where they started completely remote, um, and I'm sure it's the same for for anyone who is teaching in a in a pre-K or kindergarten environment. It's like the first time a student's going to have a chance to participate in in that setting is really uh, you know. Uh, a challenge in and of itself, just to find and know how to connect with with students most effectively. And so I keep, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, so to say, lessons learned. Um, I think one of the fears I would maybe share share that been expressed here, and Bobby mentioned about, we can't make this a mechanical process. It's really a relationship process. Um, we also um, um, probably experience this like this kind of urgency to let's fill their, you know, kind of like fill their heads with everything that was the opportunity loss that was there. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. That's not really how mm -hmm. uh, learning takes place. It's, it's actually about that meaningful engagement. And we've always known that. And so I think it's important for us to continue to uh, talk about how to do that and how to do that well. I didn't get to listen to uh, Sydney Jensen's speech, but I can only imagine uh, you know, what, what knowing her so well about her uh, strategies to engage students in the pre-pandemic moments that, that quite frankly, I think um, coming up with new strategies on the fly like everyone had to do was a, a challenge and a stress. And I think as we continue to reflect on what that means for the upcoming year, we're going to still have other challenges and continue to have challenges to overcome. And so it's really important that we give teachers time, um, that, that schools have kind of the permission to try to adjust and do that well, and that folks kind of have that right mindset coming into, into the next school year as well. So, so Commissioner, I, I, one of the things you said that I really liked was just the fact that you you set up your teacher advisory committee you've been listening to teachers and thinking about how to support teachers in this process and so i think that idea of of listening to teachers engaging with teachers working with teachers um, and giving them time is is really critical thank you uh richard bob i'm gonna i'm gonna say this humbly but yet boldly when you ask the question what do we learn we learned that it took a pandemic to pulverize an education system that did not work for all students. And I say this as a black male. Um, I say this for a lot of um, marginalized communities. But it took a pandemic to really put the U.S. system's feet under the fire. But it also gave us the speed to see. And what I'm saying is, is that this was an opportunity for us to revolutionize education as we know it. And this is also an opportunity for us to really slow down and take a look at what was happening prior to the pandemic and now what's happening uh, post pandemic or even during the pandemic to really take a keen look at what are we doing to make sure learning is equitable for all students. And how do we address unfinished learning? We address unfinished learning by, included, by including the voices of the unheard. Students, teachers, 
community members who are often unheard, who are often not at the table, we include and we implement. Because I've been in plenty of spaces where they hear, but they don't do. They hear, but they don't implement. I think now is the time, and it's a special time for us to not only hear, but to do, uh, to do what is necessary to make sure that when we come back, that is much different than the system that we were in previously. And so those two things, I just really wanted to say humbly and boldly, because I feel like this is an opportunity of a lifetime that was mentioned by um, uh, Nebraska's uh, commissioner. And so we really have to uptake this. We really have to take this serious and, and move forward in the right direction so that all students um, can really experience the educational system um, that is for them and not against them. So I, I heard two really strong things in there. One was not just check the box in terms of we listened, but but listen and, and actually do things that make a difference. And then the other part is being really conscientious and explicit in being really, really explicit about listening to the voices of those that are unheard and and uh, marginalized. Thank you. We are we are coming down to we've got um, a few minutes left, but not uh, not a whole lot of time. We're at the the last portion of our, our roundtable, and I want to thank um, thank you so much for for these discussions. So we'll just uh, fit in as as many questions as as we can uh, in our remaining time, and I guess um, I'll start with Ariana. Um, you know I. I would hope that every, all our participants and everyone has a subscription to Education Week and uh, is, is reading your articles that uh, you're writing on, on student and teacher resilience and well-being because uh, you've covered it extensively and I hope they're uh, printing them out or cutting them out and uh, laminating them and putting up on their fridge. But, but just in case they're, they're not doing that, you know, you've, you've written extensively. Um, and, but you've also talked about uh, toxic positivity, and Sydney Jensen mentioned that this morning. You just want to share a little bit about some of the, the dangers of, of toxic positivity, what it is, and how we want to it. People can have good intentions and make mistakes. I, I know I've done it as an educator a lot, but we need to understand when we make a mistake so that we don't continue to make the mistake. You want to share a little more about that, please? Absolutely. And I just want to say, um... You know, nobody has to laminate my articles and put on their fridge. My parents don't even do that. So, um, but I appreciate the sentiment. Uh, yeah, so I think actually um, toxic positivity is in interesting because I think Korsha kind of touched on this. I think it is an, an attempt to sort of try to force people to be resilient or encourage people to be resilient that often backfires. And I think kind of the best definition I found of toxic positivity was that it's the idea or the concept of trying to kind of dismiss very legitimate feelings of anxiety, fear, or worry um, with sort of saccharine out of the box phrases like, oh, it could be worse, or look on the bright side, or I'm sure there's a silver lining if you just look for it. Um, and the reason this can be bad is because one, it, well, it dismisses you know, people's very real and legitimate feelings. Um, two, it doesn't actually help them feel better. Oftentimes people aren't like, oh, you're right. If only somebody had just reminded me that it could be worse. Now I remember, now I feel great. Um, and finally, it often makes people feel guilty about the feelings that they were having. Um, and I, I think it's important to also note that toxic positivity is something that you can do to other people. Um, educators can do it to students. Students can do it to each other. Educators can do it to one another. Um, but you can also do it to yourself. Uh, that's you know, I, I know I personally often tell myself, oh, it could be worse. You could have it much worse um, instead of acknowledging the, the legitimate feelings that I have. And I think for me, one of the most eye opening things that I learned while reporting on this is that, you know, negative emotions aren't always bad. They can have good qualities. They are adaptive. There's a reason we have bad feelings. Um, anxiety, for instance, during a pandemic that can be helpful. It helps you keep your distance from people. It puts just enough fear into you that you wear a mask or you wash your hands. Um, you know, obviously it can become problematic if it 
keeps you from ever leaving the house or you're scared of everything, in which case it's kind of crossed the line and it's no longer productive. Um, I think in talking to people about toxic positivity and you know what you should do, because I think most people, this comes from a very, a very good place, right? They do want to help. Um, I think if you're the kind of person, and sometimes I am this person, who wants to t make people feel better, <laughs> instead of saying that it could be worse or trying to offer some sort of thoughts on you know, what they could be thinking differently to help them through a tough time, it's best to just stop and listen. Um, that's probably the most important uh, tack you can take. And I also, I just, of course, I had said a couple things that I thought were really, really related to this. Um, she also talked about how she would go to her class and say, uh, you know, I'm not feeling great today, but I'm going to work through it for you guys. And that is something I heard time and time again from expert after expert, that it is important for educators to model these feelings, feelings that are, you know, not, you know, not perfect, not good feelings for your students. Um, and also, so you have the opportunity to model how you deal with them. Um, so I don't know, is that, has that uh, touched on everything you want to discuss in terms of toxic yes, positivity? That, that's absolutely. And I, I think it's, I think one of the worst things that can happen, someone's sad or someone's grieving, the, the, the worst thing that can happen is to try and tell them, well, you made a mistake to feel that way. Uh, you know, that, that is, or you really need to, you should not feel that way. Um, I, I go back to Richard's comment, we can't get learning right if we're doing grief wrong. We can't, we can't get learning right if we're doing sadness wrong. Um, and there's, there's a lot of those emotions that are uh, very legitimate, uh, very honest, and, and we need to let students uh, get within the place. Some of the things that Korsha shared today um, made, that, that's what she had to go through, made me angry. I, I think anger, anger was a, is a legitimate, emotion in that in that situation um, but getting that blend of you know a proportion of anger a proportion of hope a proportion of joy and so that our students um, can experience this in a meaningful way is really important so thank you um, dr. Richard Warren I guess you're you're helping recruit and prepare future teachers many aspiring teachers had a very different student teaching and learning experience during the pandemic and are now entering the teaching profession this fall um, what are the, some of the strengths these teachers bring to the profession? What are some of the additional supports these teachers need from HR or from their principals and colleagues this fall? Um, what, what advice and strategies do you have? And we are coming to the end of the time, so it, if we can have like a, a two-minute response would be great. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I, I think, just this is my thought, teacher, achie teacher achievement is not just determined by how adequate you are but it's equally impacted by how adaptive you are. And I think the teachers who are getting ready to come into the school systems um, are bringing the strength of adaptability, right? They have managed to teach and do their student experiences, student teachings, internships, online, virtual. They have been taught traditional ways and mechanisms with their textbooks, but then they get to their senior year and everything changes. So I think they're bringing a level of adaptability which is going to be really, really useful for school districts um, that, that hire them. I also think that these teachers are bringing a mindset of innovation instead of duplication, right? That they're coming with new ideas, new strategies, and they're not just going to confine to the old way of doing things in the traditional curriculum, the traditional methods, that they're coming in with innovation. So I think that's going to be another strength that districts can harness and leverage um, to make sure that all students are getting what they need. But I do believe that those teachers were robbed of the reality of a full-time in-person classroom, right? And so some of the additional supports that these teachers will need from like HR, principals, and their colleagues, they're gonna need post-pandemic classroom management and student engagement support, right? And when you think about HRs, we need to really be thinking about how we're investing into comprehensive induction, mentoring, and coaching support. What does your induction and coaching support program look like? This is gonna be critical, not only for teachers to thrive, but to survive and be retained for years to come, right? School leaders need to look at how they're scaling and they need to rethink, rethink observations and deliverables, right? Because these uh, pre-service teachers who are now coming in, they might not have all of the things that's on that observation checklist um, 
that's on that deliverable checklist or that at a glance checklist or that snapshot that the principal may be looking for. They may not have that experience yet. And so I think a level of grace um, needs to be looked, uh, needs to be kept in mind. I think they might need to modify a little bit of that and scale it up um, to give them time to really catch up to their unfinished learning, right? And I also think as far as for colleagues, um, resource relays, anybody who's in the building uh, with these, these new teachers should be kind of running to them to make sure that they have what they need, give them resources, perhaps lessons that are effective, perhaps strategies that are effective for in-person learning. And, and really just come alongside of them because we don't want isolation to breed incubation. And what I mean by that is, is that a teacher might feel isolated and then they'll go all into themselves and they won't share, they won't do anything. And then ultimately um, they'll burn out much faster. So those are just some ways. And I hope I made it short enough um, to really kind of address. No, um, no I, I, think, I think making this really supportive in a, in a meaningful way and welcoming these new colleagues is really important. I had an experience once where I showed up and I had, I had no desks in my room. And it's like they all, all the good desks went somewhere else. And like, well, you need to find your own desk. You're the new person on the block. And this idea of, of welcoming and supporting each other, I think, is, is really important. Uh, we just have a, a few minutes left, a couple minutes left. But, uh, Korsha, I, I guess as you lead your fourth grade classroom this fall, um, what, what are the key strategies you're looking as you seek to build a student-centered classroom that creates a sense of community where every student can thrive and feel respected, valued, and safe? How are, how are you entering that and how do you plan to build that this fall? So there are a couple of key um, areas that I really focus on to create that space um, that allows me to um, create transformative leaders and learners, and for me to, to do some transformative teaching. Um, and the first part of that is really that healthy identity teaching. Um, I start off the year with a community unit that lasts about eight weeks, where students are learning about themselves, their values, who they are, the color of their skin, their hair texture, their religion, or lack thereof, and how that um, impacts how they learn and how they show up in spaces. And what that really does is that it creates a space for that child, that student, to be their authentic self. Um, I model that through sharing my identity, who I am, um, as an individual, not just as an educator or teacher. Um, and that allows them to see who they are. Um, and for many of my students who look like me, that is you know, a great way for them to see that, that mirror. And then for the students that don't, it's, it's a window. I'm giving them a different perspective, a different way of looking at the world um, and really making sure that they're using critical thinking skills uh, when they're hearing maybe rhetoric that's racist or that's harmful. Um, and then I think about just in general, the key pieces that I um, really hone in on in this whole year. Um, and it's that autonomy, right? Making sure that all my students know that they're independent, that they're capable, that I believe in them. It's that support um, because I really believe in the power of interdependence. Um, it's that firmness, like I'm young, but I will check you, don't try me. And it's that unconditional love um, that really allows me to build real and authentic relationships that allows us to get through years like this, where I had a student start off her first day of school calling me the B word, she trashed my classroom, she threw a whiteboard at me. And the last day of school, she was sobbing and wouldn't let me go. Um, and that didn't happen overnight, that took um, a lot of time, a lot of tears, a lot of energy from both of us, but we came to that um, and she was able to have an incredible year uh, because of it. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we just, we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, Bobby, uh, your, your closing thoughts? Um, from what I'm hearing from the panel, uh, I, I feel like I'm really hopeful for this fall. It, this is a chance for us to reevaluate our priorities and what is it that is truly the essence of public education? What is the core of education? When we talk about learning loss, what things are we willing to let go and what things do we say, no, these are the things that are truly worth fighting for and these are the things that we that we want to keep and move forward with in education. And, 
And I'm excited that there are so many strong young people coming into the profession who say public education is more than numbers and it's more than just facts on, on in a book. It is it is becoming activated participants in their democracy because I think that's what public education truly should be. So I, I, I'm emboldened by the conversation we had today and also by the idea that all of America right now is thinking about what what should public education be now? Bobby, thank you very much. And um, Commissioner Bloomstead, I, I hope it's okay, but I, I did, uh, I just want you to know that when we wanted to have a commissioner on this panel, we just didn't put 50 in a hat and pull one out. Um, we, we really looked for a commissioner that is really engaged with teacher leaders and teachers in meaningful ways. And, and you um, rose to the top list and had many people advocating for you to be on this panel very quickly. I just want to, uh, you've already mentioned that you've had a, a, a teacher advisory panel and reached out to teachers. But I, there's lots of, lots of commissioners that do that, but you do it in a way where teachers really feel connected, that you recorded your superintendent meetings and then released them publicly to the public and to all teachers so they knew exactly what was going on, that you listened and heard and gave them time for their struggles was really, really appreciated. And one of the, uh, one of the quotes that I got from this was, uh, said uh, Commissioner Bloomstead, he's a very strong yet humble leader who believes passionately about equity and the role of public education in, in building a more equitable society. So this engaging with teachers and teacher leaders in this struggle and in this challenge is uh, really valued. And thank you, um, thank you for being on this panel. And to, we are at time. And I want to respect that time. So I, I want to thank all the panelists for, for being on this panel. I think this ties in really well with our uh, opening keynote, with our breakout sessions that we've had. And it's leading into our final keynote by Instoy's uh, Josh Parker. So I will, I will pass this uh, back to Natasha. And thank you for everyone for uh, being on this roundtable discussion. This has been an excellent discussion and conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I would like to, <laughs> hi. I would like to <laughs> echo what uh, Bob just said about thanking all of the panelists. Thank you so much, Corsho, Ariana, Bobby, Dr. Matthew, Dr. Richard. There, there, there are so many topics that you talked about today that I could highlight, but I want to keep us on uh, track in terms of time. And I would need to also give the appropriate amount of time to introduce our keynote, our closing keynote speaker. So now we are at the fourth and final segment of our summit for today. And um, our keynote speaker, you are, you are in for a treat as you have been all day. Our closing keynote speaker is someone who is so dynamic and influential and one of the most prominent leaders in the field of education. And this is Mr. Josh Parker, the 2012 Maryland Teacher of the Year and the Vice Chair of Equity for NSTOI. Josh Parker's mission in education and life is to help people and solve problems. Throughout his career, he's achieved both goals. He served students and teachers within the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. corridor as an ELA instructional coach, language arts department chair, secondary language arts teacher, professor, and compliance specialist. He is probably also a superhero on the side, right? He's also served teachers, administrators, educational leaders throughout the country as the Senior Director of Programs and Engagement at Unbound Ed. Mr. Parker, a Teaching Channel Laureate and Education Week writer, was also a Lowell Milken unsung hero in 2017 NEA Global Fellow in 2013, and as I mentioned earlier, the Maryland Teacher of the Year, and that was 2012. The list goes on and on and on, and I don't have enough time to tell you all of his accolades, but for now, he is a full-time educational consultant, 
and lives with his wife of over a decade, Tiffany, and their two children, Layla and Joshua. It is my true honor to introduce the closing keynote for today, Mr. Josh Parker. Thanks so much, uh, Natasha. That was such a great introduction. Um, halfway through, I was wondering who you were mentioning. So <laughs> uh, I'm glad it's me. So that's great. Uh, but thank you so much. And uh, you're a superstar as well. Actually, we just um, in one of my classes or uh, class that I'm teaching right now, we just reviewed one of your blog posts. So thank you for your contributions and all that you do for education. Greetings, everyone. I'm happy to be here. There's a lot to discuss today. And uh, I really want to just acknowledge the National Network of State Teachers of the Year and the great job that Bob and Lauren and the team have done to put on a phenomenal summit. I'm so appreciative of all the work that they do um, and also what they've done to make today special. I want to shout out, of course, all the technology folks that are making this moment happen and also all the people in front who have done, um, done different um, panels and breakouts. Just thank you all for making today such a fantastic moment for educators and leaders and community members beyond our borders. And I'm so happy to close this out because the table has been set. So I'm going to try my best uh, to get a good meal for y'all in this next 30 minutes, 29 minutes now. All right. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the power of next. The power of next is, is my talk for today. And my division for this talk is going to be in before, now, and next. Before, now, and next. So if you're watching right in the comfort of your own home, I won't hear you say this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. That's how I grew up, right in the church. I want you to say there is power in next. Actually, I think I heard you all say that, so that's cool. <laughs> there is power in next. <laughs> I'm super excited. So I want you to remember three numbers at the beginning. I will come back to these numbers at the end. Three numbers are 25, 50, and 66. 25, 50, and 66. I want to say from the outset, for all the teachers that have done such a magnificent job during this unprecedented time, thank you. And we need you now to create what's next. So 23 years ago, I was in Memphis, Tennessee. My family is from Memphis, Tennessee. A mother and father grew up there. And we went to visit a church uh, with some of my family friends, uh, my mother and father's friends. And um, one of the friends, his name was Mr. Cliff. And Mr. Cliff uh, had a mother and we were giving our pleasantries and uh, his mother, a beautiful woman, um, had glasses on and she was in blue. We were right in front of a, a church service and she was shaking all the hands of my siblings and my mother, my father, and just saying hi. And so she got to me and she shook my hand and she froze. And I was like, okay, like, you know, I'm a young teenager at that time. So I'm worried, like, did I do something right to this woman? I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> so she, she froze and she looked at me and it seemed like when she looked at me, she was looking through me in time. It was powerful. And she looked back at my family friend, um, Cliff, Mr. Cliff, and she said, this boy is going to speak to thousands. This boy is going to speak before many people. Now, at the time, you know, I'm 15. I'm like, uh, OK, <laughs> right? I hope it's a good reason for me speaking in front of all these people. But she said, believe me. And she looked at me with a look that I will never forget. She says, when I see these things in my spirit, I'm never wrong. And so I want to really bring that out as that experience is part of my before, right? We have all had a before. I'm speaking to you right now in the now, 
but really we've all had a before as a person, right? When I speak about the idea of before, I'm talking about that time in your life when I met the, the lady down in Memphis, right? When your norms, values, beliefs, habits, loyalties are really formed in that before, that formative part of your life. So let me ask you a question. What type of beliefs, norms, values, and loyalties are in your before? In my before as a kid, like I wanted to be Kobe Bryant. I absolutely wanted to be a basketball player. I knew I was going to the NBA and several other boys who looked like me were going to the NBA. So that was in my before, right? Uh, in my before as a teacher growing up and I was still young the first year out, I thought that all I needed to do was to show up and kids would listen to me. <laughs> that, was, that was my before. I thought that knowing the content was more than enough in my before. And as a black man in my before, as a kid and as an adult, because my before can also be recent, I learned that my mind had to be protected from thoughts that were devaluing me. I had to learn and I had to understand in my before that I had to protect my heart from dangerous things that I could believe about myself if I didn't increase my self-esteem through knowledge of myself. And I also learned that my body was consistently in trouble. That if it was in the wrong space, in the wrong time, that it could be harmed. That's in my before. And I wanna bring up some images now to help remind us of what is in our before as a country. We have been in a tremendous before. Our before has a reach. And that reach is really important because it sets up all of the things that come after. So our before really has had some great moments in a country with education, but it's also had some moments to forget. As you see on the screen, there are images where in our before as Americans, we had to fight for equal rights. Integration was a struggle. This is in our before as a country. The reason why that's important is because if you ignore your before, it's going to show up in the now in ways you cannot anticipate. Your before matters. We have had a before as a country that was steeped in these type of battles over what's right or what should be taught. We've had a before even recently, right? Before COVID, right? That before was still steeped in this inequity that exists in too many schools and in too many places. And we must teach the before. What's the use in banning a theory if the practices are still in place? No, we're going to teach the before because the before has a reach that matters. We will teach it. Because before has a reach and it sets up really the importance of now. Now matters almost more than ever, all right? Think about what you're doing right now. Think about what is happening in this moment. Now has been created by before, but exists moment by moment in the schools and in the places that we call our work and our home. So here's why now matters. <laughs> now matters, unfortunately, because there still are remnants of before that are showing up now. You're not seeing in color pictures from 1960s. These are in color pictures from six weeks ago, from six months ago. This is recent and this is why now matters because we have to understand that now has a relationship to before. So we have to understand that it's still present and it's still here. But here's the beauty of that, and this is why now is really important. Now is important because it's the place where equity can thrive. Equity happens in the now. It happens in the moments between what was before and what can come. When I think about equity, I think about the times when I've been in class, right? Where I have seen a student struggle 
And then also I've seen them be frustrated with a learning assignment. And what I did in that moment really determined how much equity that student would receive. So the now matters because equity exists in the now, in the moments, in the decisions that we're making. So let me ask you another question. What are you doing with your now? Are you in either one of those pictures in spirit or in actuality? Are you in those pictures by the things that you promote in the classroom? Where are you and how are you using your now? Because just as important and just as possible as it is to promote equity in the now, it's also extremely possible to promote inequity in the now. This is why now is so important. It's happening moment by moment. And it's where inequity can just sit and maintain a place. It's where I see a problem, but I say it's gonna take too much. So I won't deal with it right now. Or when I see something happening that has been happening for a long time, but I won't get to it now, I actually am gonna to try to get to it later. I'm here to tell you that now is critically important because it is the place and the pivot point for where equity can live or equity can die. So again, I'm going to ask you, what are you doing with your now? Because before has a reach, it sets up what is now, but I'm here to tell you, this is where I wanna spend the bulk of the rest of my time. Next actually has the power to change it all. So I wanna go back to the earlier part of my message when I talked about the, the lady that was in Memphis that told me about what I would do. Well, fast forward some years later, I'm an adult, uh, I've taught for a few years and um, I got really, really fortunate to run for my county teacher of the year position. Um, and I was like, okay, great, I'll try it out. Didn't think I was gonna win. So, okay, the, the biggest crowd that I had spoken to before then was probably 30 kids in front of my class. And so I uh, went and I became a finalist for the Maryland Teacher of the Year. Now, prior to that moment, there had only been one African-American male Teacher of the Year in the state, Will, um, and there had been none from Baltimore County Public Schools. And so when I won that night, it was a surreal moment. And I went up to the stage and when I looked out over the crowd, it was over a thousand people. And I was reminded of what that lady said in Memphis of what I would do. So her understanding of what was next for me came true in that moment. And it has powered me through some of the most difficult and powerful times in my life. I've had mountaintop moments. I've had really, really low moments where there's been challenges that I never thought that I would see. But it is the power of next and what that lady said and what I saw for myself that pulled me through all of those nows to create a better next. So I'm gonna now talk to you about the power of next and what we want to do with it, all right? So again, you gotta repeat after me. And I know, listen, I know I can't hear you, but if you're not saying it, um, some, something's gonna happen, okay? So again, Repeat after me, there is power in next. Okay, I'm hearing it all over the country. Okay, awesome, awesome. So there's a couple of parts to the power of next and there are four specific parts that I wanna lean into right now. If you wanna leverage the power of next in your life and in educational communities, you're gonna to have to see next, invest in next, organize for next, and co-create next. Right now, it's July, but I'm gonna tell you what got me a little upset, even though I'm no longer in the classroom, I went to a Target the other day and there's already school supplies up. Hey, <laughs> I'm sitting like, hey, we should, we could need some more before here. We don't need what's next right now. Like, But next is coming, right? We've been through a pandemic, right? And we're still in one, but next is coming, right? Next school year is coming. I just saw one article on Twitter where uh, uh, an organization, a school district is coming back early August, August 2nd. That's less than three weeks or from now, right? So 
next is coming, but we have to be able to leverage the power of next, which I argue is the most powerful time that we can have in order to get to that next level. So how do we do it? Let's start with this. You got to see next. This is not a light point. We have a lot of people that can talk about next, but can they see next? What does next look like, right? For kids that are on the screen that I have, for kids of all races, what does next look like for them? What does next look like for you as a teacher? Remember I said, we need you now for what we can create next. If you're looking for ways to see your own next, what are you bothered by right now? What is bringing you pain, right? What is actually something that is engaging you and that you lose track of time um, focusing on? Those are the things that are a part of your next. So what can you do with that? Talk about it, imagine it, close your eyes and look for it with your heart. Talk with others about it. If, if you need to, draw it, right? Write a song about it. But you gotta think about it and see what's next. Because if you can't see what's next, there's no sense in moving in the now because it will always be rooted in the before. So you gotta see what's next. Not just what's next, what's the next CDC guideline, right? That's of course important. But what's the next interaction my kids are going to need when I come back to school? What's the next intervention that I'm gonna do with kids who may have been missing from school that's gonna honor that they didn't lose learning, they learned something, and I can actually honor who they are as a student by piling on the learning, right? What is a scaffold that's not gonna dumb down the instruction, but is going to level them up, right? What's the next interaction that they're going to need to maintain their dignity? Some students, actually a lot of students, have just witnessed a murder on screen with George Floyd. What kind of, what kind of idea and what kind of support are they going to need next? We have to see next. We need a lot more people that can really see what's next. And so, what are you seeing right now for the next in your life? What are you seeing right now when you come back to school? You have to see next. It's really critical. So the next point I want to bring up, you don't just see next. Once, once you see it and you can visualize it, you actually have to invest in next. This is an important point that I want to bring up. If you're not invested in next, then you only have stock in before. You have to invest in next. What does that mean? That means if I invest in next, I got to think about what is it that I have to leave from before? Norms, values, habits, loyalties. If I'm committed to an equitable next. Isn't it funny? We've only talked about learning loss in the context of kids. Might there be some learning loss that adults might need? We don't think about it like that. Because I know whenever I become a better teacher and a better person, there's some learning loss that I needed and then there's some learning that I added because I was invested in what's next. You have to invest in what's next with your mind and with your heart but also with your body. How often do you visit the places where the kids are that you serve? How often do you communicate with the community, right? We have to invest not just in our money, because we invest enough of that. If you're a teacher, you invest a lot of your money, but invest your time, your heart, and your mind in the people and the students that you serve. So if you're going to harness the power of next, you're gonna to have to see next. You're gonna to have to invest in what's next. And what that means is, what is it that I have to lose? And then what do I have to gain in order to be invested in what's next? Too many people in education, I've been that person before, are so invested in before that they mess up the next for themselves and others. The next part 
of harnessing this power of next is you got to organize for next. Listen, next doesn't just happen, right? You're seeing the image right now of Zaila Avant-Garde, right? She, she organized her schedule and time to get three Guinness Book World Records before becoming a spelling bee champ, which was her side gig, right? You got to organize for next. And I want to come to this point. Organize for next means making space in your heart and in your head and your classroom for what the next movement should look like. We can't continue to only talk about the achievement gap. What happens when the achievement gap is resolved? We got to organize for that and beyond. If we're just organizing for resolving the achievement gap, then that's where we'll stay. Let's organize for the gap and beyond because there's more than just a gap that we need to mind. We got to organize. How can we organize our schedule and our day to include more learning about cultures that are different than our own? How can we organize the classrooms virtually, right? There are breakout room spaces. How can we organize spaces where kids can be their full and authentic selves? How can I organize with other people to create affinity groups and or sort of groups that can lobby for the changes that are needed in schools? We have to organize for next if we're going to harness the power of next. So, the last piece that I really want to bring up, right? We're harnessing the power of next. We first have to see next. We have to invest in next. We have to organize for next. And then we have to co-create next. We have to create next with other people. And I argue that we have to create next with the people that we serve, the kids and the community. We can't harness the power of next if the only people that we're working with are ourselves. We have to work with those that are with our cause. We have to try to work with those that in good faith um, can sort of work with us in the cause, right? But we have to co-create that future that I talked about seeing and then creating. So we have to co-create next. Do you remember those numbers from the first part of my talk? What are those numbers? Okay, some of y'all got like one or two of them. <laughs> the numbers are 25, 50, and 66. 25, 50, and 66. 25 refers to the percent of teachers, according to a recent study, that are considering leaving the profession after this year. That's one in four. 50 is the percent of teachers who are Black that are considering leaving the profession after this school year. That's one in two. 50.7 million kids are actually coming back to school this fall. 50.7 million kids. But if I were to give this talk at the beginning of a school year or the middle of the school year, 66 kids would have dropped out on average by the end of the speech. So I use those numbers to help us understand that the power of next isn't just using the ideas of the, the, the present or the past to create a special next for you. The power of next is actually in the next that you can create for those who need it. I submit to you that maybe those students, some who've dropped out, teachers who are considering leaving, Maybe it's been hard for you to see your next. Maybe you're in organizations that um, are making it really hard for you to see what's next for you or they can't see your next. I wanna tell you that if you're in an organization or a district or in a situation where someone who is leading you can't see your next, you might need to change your now. Because we need you now to create what's next. I'll conclude with this. 
There have been many times um, in my life and certainly in this pandemic crisis where I've been so consumed with what's now, like what's happening now, what's the latest numbers, uh, uh, when will school open, um, what's happening right now. But what I've begun to learn is that there is a power in seeing a next that is equitable for all, that includes all, and that has the potential to lift everyone into a space where they can be their highest and best self. Repeat after me again. There is power in next. There is power in next. There is power in next. So I leave you with this question. How will you use it? Thank you. And I will say there is power in next. Thank you so much, Josh. I hope everyone feels empowered, empowered as much as I do by the power Thank of you. next and your uh, closing keynote. That was an extraordinary conclusion to our day. And I'd like to also thank all of the presenters, speakers, panelists, but more important, I'd like to thank everyone who engaged with us today throughout this summit. I am super excited and energized and I hope you are as well from every session of this year's 2021 NSTOI Summit on Student and Teacher Resilience and Wellbeing. If you haven't already received one, you will receive an email shortly with your certificate of attendance, but this email will also have a survey. And we're asking that you please take a minute to add your thoughts to that survey by responding to the link in that email that you will receive. Also, in the upcoming weeks, please look out for access to recordings of all the sessions, including the keynotes, the round table, and all the breakout session sessions. Since today, uh, you were only able to really select one of those four phenomenal breakout sessions. We hope that you continue to engage with us on Twitter, at NSTOI, and also on Facebook. Our Facebook page is at NSTOI Teachers Leading. We are looking forward to continuing our collaboration with you on this most important topic of resilience and well being. And we look forward to connecting with you to continue to significantly impact the field of education, the future of education for all students. Thanks again for joining us today. Continue to be resilient and be well. <laughs>